Good morning, literature lovers. Uh, we're back again. This week we are talking about uh, Stephen Dunn's novel, uh, Potted Meat. Uh, and next week we'll be moving on to Sela Satterstrom's uh, book, Slab. And then we'll be ending um, at least this summer's talks on uh, the transmigration of bodies by Yuri Herrera, which is translated by Lisa Dillman. Uh, and so we're in the contemporary fiction phase of the course. In my previous lectures, I have done a lot of historical work, and this is just an intro. Uh, um, these lectures are, are, are directed for uh, introductory types of students. Um, and we had to cover lots of period shifts. So there's so much stuff that I, you know, just haven't covered and that we haven't had time to read. We didn't have time to read a 19th century novel, for example. They're really long and we only have um, a short time together this summer. Uh, so uh, uh, I want to re-hit some of the, the broad themes as we're kind of ending, um, moving towards the end of, of the course in the next three weeks here. Um, and so uh, we began with uh, a translation, a contemporary translation by Anne Carson of Euripides Bacchae. We moved on to Shakespeare's Macbeth, uh, and we were talking about themes of sacrifice and themes of tragedy. That's been the broad theme for this class. Now, Aristotle, in his poetics, had given us some terminology used for uh, tragedies such as peripatia, hubris, hamartia, and one of the things in classical tragedy was that the noble figure had to be noble, had to be high born, um, so that there was a place for the person to fall, right? And the audience was supposed to feel some sort of pity and terror uh, at the fall um, of the person who, not necessarily through any fault of their own, right? Like, um, and uh, and th th I think that's the big difference between um, uh, some modern readings and particularly Christian readings of, of tragedy that would like to see in uh, the tragic fall, they would like to see something like the fall of, of, of humans or the fall of man um, through something like sin um, or original sin. But that concept does not exist for Aristotle and the ancient Greeks. It's a later concept. Now it does show up in, of course, um, so it shows up through um, the writings of, of St. Augustine in particular, if you want to track that kind of um, uh, religious type of, of argument. Um, sin, or just, just to be very clear, sin in um, uh, uh, the ways that Christians read it, and, and this means Catholic and later Protestant, right? Christian in the big sense. Uh, uh, in, in writers such as St. Augustine, uh, uh, that no notion of original sin and the fall is very different from Judaism. So just to be very clear, Jewish people do not see the fall of man in, uh, in Eden, in uh, Eve eating the apple. So be very careful, because I think that, that that kind of concept of where evil comes from um, and the sort of fall from grace uh, uh, is a really um, uh, widespread notion in Western culture and um, what so whether or not you are like a religious person or something you you might be familiar with that kind of story and that, that just speaks to the hegemony or the dominance right of Christian narratives um, culturally um, even in a so-called secular culture <clears throat> whereas Jewish people don't see that as that that original sin thing as happening or 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 being the place for a fall um and i'm gonna I've, I've got limited time today so if you want to talk to me more about that in office hours um uh, those are interesting sort of uh religious um questions but for us right now like macbeth the way we were reading macbeth was i was i was showing you how scholars balance and this tension between whether or not the play is a pagan play or a christian play and the readings, especially of it being a um, rather pagan play, draw on a notion of dissent um, in, in, in the reading of Shakespeare, that Shakespeare intentionally uses 
um, periods such as pre-Christian periods um, uh, uh, or distant time periods, time periods of the distant past, so that he can more he can have more freedom to express concerns of his contemporary situation under King James, um, the first of England, the sixth of Scotland, um, and the religious um, situation of um, of England in, dur uh, during his time period, right, where everybody was required to go to church, right. So if you ever learn about pilgrims um, coming to the United States. They're called nonconformists, right? Those nonconformists were not conforming to the Anglican church, right? And so they first go to Netherlands and then they eventually make their way with a grant. Um, they get a, a land grant kind of from, from King James to go start a colony in so-called New England. And so then we get that, that whole other uh, American trajectory from that. Okay, so so uh, Shakespeare is balancing that kind of pagan versus Christian notion, and it comes in the Renaissance, and during the Renaissance, there is this um, increasing focus on humanism, right? The belief that humans, through knowledge, through increasing sci increasingly scientific knowledge, right, through rationality, that we are going to come to decipher the world, right? Like Copernicus and the you know the sun right that the earth um the sun doesn't go around the earth the earth goes around the sun and that we're we're not just like even our solar system is not by any means the center of our galaxy right and neither is our galaxy the center of the universe for example right um, and once you get that kind of expanding out types of notions um you get uh people trying to either reject earlier theological ideas such as Christianity and entering into the age of reason, secularity, for example, or they try to reconcile those two ideas, right? Uh, so how can science, for example, uh, decode the laws that are behind how the universe works so that it might prove the existence of uh, some sort of higher design or something like that. And those debates go right up into the present moment. I'm not going to cover them uh, um, completely here, but you get increasingly a shift between temporality, temporal histor um, historical reality, um, uh, as opposed to um, a kind of, I, I will call it allegorical reality right now um, uh, that sees um, uh, divinity or the gods, if we're going to talk pagan stuff, as in, in, uh, persistent in all sorts of, of ways of being in the world. Um, increasingly after the Protestant Reformation, you get an, a transcendent God, right? who's above and, and sort of sets things a little bit in motion. Um, maybe you can compare it to Aristotle's notion of the prime mover, for example. Um, uh, so you're getting these, these mixed ideas in the Renaissance, which was the rebirth, right, of uh, ancient Greek knowledge with uh, um, European Christianity. And that becomes super influential in, in Western politics and culture and, of course, literature. Uh, increasingly, as modernity, so we're talking modernity from like the like the late 1500s to the present, right? Shakespearean English is modern English. It's not old English, as I said in an earlier lecture. Um, and with that, you get the birth of the form of literature known as the novel, right? And that's where we're at now. We've done some short stories. We've done poetry. We haven't talked about novels yet. The word novel means new. Right. Um, so the novel as an art form is always trying to um, say something new, which is a kind of very modern notion in and of itself. Like, how can we say something new? Uh, and uh, it's written in prose. It was associated, especially early on, it was supposed to, it, was, it was not considered high art at all. So just like Shakespeare was not necessarily considered high art or capital L literature for his time. Um, uh, early novels were not necessarily associated as high art. They were treated maybe like the ways people might treat comic books today as pulp, just entertainment, whatever. You binge watch it on Netflix. That's not real serious literature. Serious literature at that time uh, dealed with uh, the classics, dealed with the Greeks and the Romans. 
And so you see, you know, Shakespeare flirts with that, with some of the subject matter of his plays. Um, not the ones that we read, but like Julius Caesar, Antony and Cleopatra, Coriolanus, for example. Uh, but uh, um, increasingly, the, the, the novel uh, um, is associated with women, with women writers. So this is an emergent um, kind of category. So it's considered feminine and like real men wrote poetry. Um, and we see a shift in that kind of gendered relationship, I think, um, throughout time. Uh, um, a, a kind of feminization of, of poetry, which I think is a, is a says a lot about about how fluid gender identities can be. Um, uh, we're used to talking about how women might have been like restricted socially in the past, and that's definitely true. Um, but uh, gender identities are 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 not nearly as fixed um, as as um, so, uh, social desire might portray them to be. Right. Sometimes social desire, when we read it in literature, portrays something to be ideal because the actual situation is that things are much more complex or um, that there's much more of a gray area, particularly around ideas of sexuality, sexual orientation. Uh, um, so as the novel emerges remember back to my lecture last week on hegel and marx and i talked about hegel's master slave dialectic right that history moves towards an idealized notion a perpetual peace is what immanuel kant calls it and that through civilization we're working out these conflicts and conflicts and we're going to move towards um, a kind of heavenly idea that is a very Christian and providence oriented idea, right? That we're on the track road to kind of progress and that we are going to through um, off Hebung, which is the um, uh, Hegel's term for uplifting, that through this dialectical tension between the master and the slave, we get a coming together of synthesis, so thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and a moving up to a new thesis and then a new thesis and a new thesis. And that is the way that modernity saw history working. Now, Marx came along and criticized that idealism with what he called dialectical materialism. And dialectical materialism says history is not through this idealized no notion of, of, of progress towards, towards some abstract and, and largely Christian idea of, an, uh, of, of peace or heaven or, um, the second coming of, of a savior or something like that. Marx says, no, actually history is driven by class struggle over material conditions, over the actual resources of food, land, being able to live well, who has money, and that he sees revolutions as um, being this tension. So he's taking a lot from his teacher Hegel, but he sees it as a much more materialist um, critique. Now, in the 20th century, uh, we see that kind of critique showing up in all sorts of different ways, experimentations with both versions of Marxism, such as uh, um, Vladimir Lenin and um, uh, uh, in, in the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, for example. And then that, of course, becomes the Soviet um, Republic and we get, you know, uh, totalitarianism like Stalin and things like that. Um, uh, uh, and then you get Mao in China, for example, in the 20th century, the Cold War, all of this stuff, the big tensions between the West and the East, which in some ways still frame a lot of the ways that we think, even though we are in an increasingly, quote, globalized world. So especially people in the older generation still, I think, tend to think in terms of those uh, uh, big, big, you know, um, contrasts between the West and the East. Um, in the 1990s, and especially after 9-11, you got more of this kind of discussion of, of uh, the clash of civilizations, which was part of a, a book by Samuel Huntington, a famous book from the 1990s. Um, and see so the, the Muslim world and the Christian world. So these big kinds of concepts of empire, um, really long historical concepts, right? Of the West versus the rest, I guess. Um, sometimes you see it um, in, um, in terms of the so-called third world or um, the global South, 
nowadays. Um, uh, so these are just ways of thinking about politics and power in the world. And what does literature do? It, it tracks social desire over time, or at least that's the definition I've given for us in this class. Um, so during the 1800s especially, we get a form of the novel that is called, the German word is Bildungsroman, capital B-I-L-D-U-N-G-S-R-O-M-A-N. Um, the building adventure, right? The roman, the romance, like a, it comes from Rome, but it's like a, a romance, uh, the adventures of Tom Sawyer, right? Uh, the adventures of Huckleberry Very Finn, that adventure notion is part of um, the roman. And that's the, that's the, the, the term in, in Europe, if you go to a bookstore and you want to get a novel, you get a roman, right? Uh, uh, so that's, uh, that's the term. In English, we tend to embrace more of that modernist trajectory, right? Of make it new, make it new, make it new, make it new. Um, if you remember Ezra Pound and uh, William Carlos Williams from my poetry lectures on imagism, the, the tagline for modernist poetry for high modernist poetry was make it new make it new how can we like not anymore be entrenched in this kind of false pretension to the classical tradition that's a big early 20th century discussion that's what's going on if you read um the dead by james joyce and gabriel the main character who's like kind of pretentious he's kind of looking to europe but he's also caught in between um, uh, this notion of very landed um, uh, notion of, of, of uh, simple Irish life, right? Uh, if you read that story. Uh, in Alice Walker's Everyday Use, for example, you see this tension between, um, in this case, a, um, a mother who has um, uh, spent her life, um, a, a very rural life, a very, um, impoverished life. So no, like, it doesn't look like there's much electricity. Um, the windows are, are commented on the small cabin where they live, um, versus, um, uh, her daughter, one of her daughters, right. Who has gone off and gone to school and, um, uh, is, is, uh, has all of these ideas about reclaiming her, her African identity, for example. Um, uh, and uh, um, uh, and how that is in in some ways in conflict, but in some ways approved approved by her mother. Right? So like um, her mother, for example, approves likes likes the way she's dressed, um, uh, but uh, um, but stealing uh, you know, just sort of taking the the quilts right from the family quilts that have been uh, made over generations to hang on a wall as art to hold it up as art right that's that uplifting off haybung that's hegel right there lift it up put it on a pedestal um uh because you shouldn't use that as everyday use right uh that's where the term in the story shows up and of course the mother um decides to give uh uh um uh, to, to, uh, to not let that happen, right? To give the quilts to her other daughter um, who has stayed there and lived um, um, in that life, the one who has burns and has um, is not the pretty one. Um, so the way that's coded in Alice Walker's story, for example. Uh, um, uh, so the novel, um, if I go, that was just a short story. If I go back to the idea of the Enlightenment novel, the Bildungsroman, if you had to read Great Expectations by Charles Dickens growing up in school, that's, that's a Bildungsroman. Uh, and to a certain extent, you get this in the mid 20th century with a book that's commonly taught in high school, a beautiful book, and it gets confused with just being young adult literature without sort of really seeing some of its literary achievements, and uh, at least that, that's my opinion, is Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird, where um, what you get is the perspective of young um, children um, who don't understand what racism is in their culture. Um, and so they're seeing it, and you understand through irony as a, as, as a reader what's actually happened where this, this um, a black man has been falsely accused of rape um, and what it means for Atticus Finch, the kind of the, the children's father to stand up um, for a black man and um, uh, in a really, really racist situation. Uh, 
um, and so, uh, and of course, uh, um, later on, as I mentioned with Kendrick Lamar, right? Kendrick Lamar's To Pimp a Butterfly is a play on the, the title To Kill a Mockingbird, right? So it's a direct literary reference to that story um, in this really acclaimed hip hop record. Uh, um, so the, the so-called coming of age novel shows up in the mid 20th century. Lord of the Flies is another one. Often these th novels are taught to um, adolescent children in the US, which is interesting because they're the ones who are supposed to be going through it. And so the idea is that if you give them these coming of age stories, even Harry Potter, that they can kind of see themselves or re read themselves and identify with the characters and grow up and progress. That's what happens to Harry. We see his life over eight novels um, as he develops up and goes through Hogwarts and deals with Voldemort and all of that sort of stuff. We see it in the Hunger Games trilogy, right, by Suzanne Collins, same sort of stuff. Uh, um, but the writers that we're going to be dealing with this week, um, uh, particularly Stephen Dunn and Sila Satterstrom, uh, I, I am going to say are 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 are, are sort of working within that tradition to a certain extent, but also criticizing it. They're producing their own notion of dissent. In a sense, what I'm saying is that the dissent that they are bringing is similar, a similar move anyway, to what Shakespeare did in his time where he was dealing with notions of, um, you know, pagan versus Christian, secular, how do I say things um, that couldn't otherwise be said on stage, right? You know, it's and, and on the one hand, it's a very, very Christian culture. You've got this super Christian king who writes a book on demonology. And at the same time, actually on stage, you have like a witch's Sabbath. You have some nasty violence, completely unredemptive moments of characters, right? Uh, um, uh, and so... Although he's still dealing with kings, right? Shakespeare's still dealing with kings. In uh, Potted Meat and in Slab, the book, the next two books we're reading, um, we see a um, uh, interest in the writer on the idea of a common person. The, these characters grow up um, uh, largely in impoverished places. Um, they don't. That is not necessarily to say that they themselves, as characters, are lamenting their poverty, and just um, that these are just escape narratives. Although, uh, as you will see, there's a way to maybe read that into um, the end of of Stephen Dunn's Pot of Meat. I'm not going to say a whole lot about the end because you may not have finished it. You should finish the book before you watch my lectures, but um, I don't want to. Uh, uh, give think too much away. Um, uh, so if Christian human in Christian humanism, um, that kind of blend of humanism and Christianity that we get after the Renaissance, we see on the one hand, a self passion fashioned person, the person who makes their own way in society, the person who pulls up their boot themselves by their bootstraps. Benjamin Franklin in American history is a very good example of this, like you make your own kind of fortune type of idea. Um, uh, this that character that kind of idea arises with capitalism as an economic form the idea that you can make your own fortune if you just work really hard uh, Max Weber's famous famous book the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism explored those ideas um, uh, um, and, and that's not to say we shouldn't criticize Weber from a 21st century perspective it's just an important book historically um, uh, so Christian humanism fused that self-fashioning self with the idea of an eternal soul, right? That is inside of our your, I don't know, like your head or your heart, wherever you feel like the soul might be in your body, um, if you're part of that culture. Um, uh, and that the, the, the constancy of the soul gets sort of mapped on to an internalized idea of moral conscience, you can think about this as somebody going and saying confession at church, right? And whether or not, um, uh, you know, if you're in the Catholic context, somebody tell, says confession and uh, they receive a penance from the priest. You know, it's a private thing, but then they go and they do they do their um, their penance and then they've cleaned their soul. They've wiped their slate clean. Uh, 
um, uh, Protestants remove, Protestant Christians, that's why they're protesters, they remove that kind of, uh, um, okay, so Christian humanism fuses a self-fashioned self, um, somebody who can make it on their own, with the idea of an eternal soul that is interior in the body, um, or some interiorized somewhere in the body or in self-reflection, that I think therefore I am moment from Rene Descartes. All of this characterizes the subjective turn in modernity. I was saying that Catholics uh, went to um, confession or still go to confession if you're a Catholic, and uh, Protestants remove that mediated relationship between uh, priest, pope, and uh, their god, and have a direct or personal relationship, right? So that turn towards the personal is another characterization of modernity itself. Um, and in modernity, of like as, in, and this is this is a very Euro Christian thing um, that happens. That mo that kind of modern moment, the introduction of of history and thinking of historical time as something moving to progressing towards a particular kind of future. In some ways, moving faster and faster. Like, what is that concept of the speed of with which time might move? Um, uh, very much part of modernity. Um, uh, an idealized kind of essence or soul gets mapped onto the idea of man, like man in the singular, not human. It is man. So it's still gendered, right? And when people are criticizing today in contemporary culture, when they cr criticize um, sort of white European men or Anglo-centric men or white male power, right? That is what they're critiquing, right? It, it, it is it is a essentialized notion of man that presumes that men are on top, that women are derivative of men, and that there's a kind of hierarchy to all of nature, and humans are on top of nature, on top of civilization, and that particularly European civilization has been the pinnacle. It's the most advanced, the most evolved idea. Um, and so because it's the most advanced, the idea was that Europeans thought that they should be the rightful rulers of the rest of the world, right? And that goes right up into Amer current American aspirations to empire, right? We are, we live in the United States, um, whose political structure, at least, was very influenced early on by Anglo-Protestant culture back east, right? If you have a conception of the United States as move, like, like growing from the east to the west historically, that's really different then if you're a Hopi individual, for example, I'm just I'm picking a Southwest tribe person who, um, or an Apache friend of mine who, you know, when we have testified together at the, um, at, at the Capitol against Columbus Day, for example, uh, that says, you know, my family has been in this place before this place was called a state of Colorado, right? My family has been here since at least the 1300s, and you're claiming that I'm not like a part of this society or that I belong or that we should worship this kind of European conqueror who never set foot on this continent um, uh, and celebrate the domination of my people who are still here, right? That's a Native American perspective from uh, my, my um, friend and colleague, Sky Morris over at Four Winds Native American Council here in Denver. Um, uh, um, or, or Sky and, 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 and some other women um, uh, uh, um, who, who have um, Apache heritage. Uh, <clears throat> so that's what's being critiqued, right? That's what people are talking about, like, like white male power, right? It's an essentialized notion. Um, and when people buy into that with their own personal identities, um, like for me, example, I happen to be a Caucasian person <laughs> and I am a, a, a man, right? And and sometimes I, because of the way I was raised, because the culture already sort of supports um, an idealized version of that, um, sometimes individuals do not recognize necessarily the privileges that they inherit, whether they asked for it or not, from those power structures that are historical over time, right? And that's a big part of what, of course, our nation is working out um, uh, as this morning, um, finally, the 
Washington Redskins are no longer going to be a team because finally people have seen that that was racist. It always was racist. People deny that it was that it's racist, um, but finally because the rest of the current culture is, is has uh, uh, been waking up a little bit to, to racism because of the George Floyd the uh, murders, uh, murder of him and, and other African Americans, Breonna Tyler, um, for example, this summer, we're seeing some sea change across the nation in terms of statues and things like this uh, uh, as well, um, all sorts of policies. We're in an interesting moment of social desire, right? So when we look back, uh, when we look here, um, one way to thematize this in literature is fate versus history temporality of history versus fate kind of flat history work, working on a timeline that moves um, versus fate which is kind of vertical and stays the same throughout history and um, christianity worked definitely worked with both of those and the idea of fated fated to be saved all of that sort of stuff um, so there are different variations um, what uh, Jonathan Dolomore does, and I, I mentioned this book earlier in class, and this is where I'm taking a lot of the ideas this summer. Um, so if you ever want to read more about this, um, or if you like want a question of like, is Roger, Dr. Green just kind of making this up? It's like, no, I'm actually trying on, on it's not even a, that recent of a book. It comes out in the early 80s, but it's had several editions. Um, and it just happens to be a very good, um, uh, a very good book on tragedy, because that was one of my themes this summer. Um, uh, so Dollamore says because like there are so many different convoluted notions of fate versus history um, that um, we might it might be better to think of it in terms of idealist versus materialist. So that's why I used Hegel last week in my lecture. Idealist is kind of like history progressing towards a future, a kind of second coming, a kind of Christianized way of like becoming more and more civilized. Um, versus material culture, which basically just looks at like 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 that 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 our consciousnesses are not an essence that uh, that comes from a, a a transcendent or unchanging notion of soul. Rather, what Marx said was that it is the social conditions that create consciousness itself. Right. So, um, people want to see who want to see something like a soul behind us or like like at the core of our being they want to see this kind of transcendent and unchanging thing um but marx sa says instead he kind of flips that on its head and says no it is actually um the consciousness that would idealize something like that is created by the, con the material conditions for resources um over resources um complex political um uh, stuff, but super influential for the ways that we think about novels and literature and expressing social desire. A more recent version of this kind of tension shows up between notions of bare life and qualified life. And the big writer here is Giorgio Agamben, who's an aesthetics professor in Italy. And what he says is, he's actually using Aristotle's terms, but um, he says that we have notions of bare life. There are people in the world who are only whose lives are thought of by power, people in power or regimes of power as just bare life. You're like an animal, like you're a squirrel in my backyard or a rabbit in my backyard, the bird flying through. Qualified life is, is a life that is worthy of getting rights, um, the benefits of citizenship, for example, and is called bios is the term. Zoe, the bare life, is just an egg. And what the, the current discussion has been around is that people who have been historically marginalized are treated as if they are bare life, are treated as if they are less than human. So, for example, slaves were idealized as being less than human because it justified the racist people's uh, um, attempts to stay in power historically over time, right? And so they come up with these stories. They look to the Bible, for example, and they say, well, it exists here. So, you know, it must be just your lot in life or because you're of this different race, you have like less intellectual abilities than uh, this one race that's set up to naturally kind of rule the world because they are more rational and more capable of intellectual processes than others. Um, 
Uh, so recent um, thinkers, and I'm going to point to one scholar, and then I'll just jump into Stephen Dunn's book a little bit. Um, uh, Alexander Wahelier has a good book and a concept called habeas viscous. So viscous is like the internal guts and organs, and he contrasts that to the idea of habeas corpus, which is a uh, an idea in like early modern law that's important to our legal systems that if the police arrest you they have to tell you where your people where you're being held they have to be kind of accountable habeas corpus is who has the body right to have the body itself um, and so the body there is the body of the individual modern subject who gets rights who has rights maybe even who has um, enlightenment notions of human rights for example i'm human i have these unalienable rights but what happens is that even when people express that in like u.s constitution or for example we know that even at the time other people were not being treated as fully human right historically and so people have had to fight women have had to fight to for civil rights to vote for example african americans have had to fight for um, uh, rec l l the legal right to vote, but also like like the emancipation of slavery. Native Americans have had rights forced onto them through the Indian Citizenship Act to make them into subjects of the United States when they are historically by treaty considered separate sovereign nations. And we just had some great uh, important Supreme Court decisions last week on that very issue um, down in Oklahoma. Um, you can look it up. <laughs> uh, I don't have time to go into it today. Um, and so uh, uh, um, th I think that that's a way to think of like habeas viscous instead of focusing on like, uh, well, when are we going to get our rights someday, which is kind of progress, a racial progress notion of, of, of uh, time and history and development, which are very modernist concepts. And we can go back to Hegel, but we know that historically Hegel and that kind of thinking has embedded and allowed for all sorts of racism. So current scholarship has uh, talked about like, well, what about why don't we just like kind of bracket that kind of humanist um, Christian humanist European subject? I use the term Euro Christian and let's think about um, the people who have been excluded, indigenous people definitely people of color. And now if we look back at Stephen Dunn's book here in my next few minutes before I jump to your office to office hours, um, think about some things in potted meat. As you write discussion posts this week, how do you think that Stephen Dunn is dealing with perhaps a critique of humanistic ideas, even though we might see forms of the, uh, the Bildungsroman or development novel or the coming of age novels showing up in his work, how might he be performing a kind of descent? And the same thing for Sila Satterstrom's slab for next week. Um, are these coming of age stories or are they participating in a Bildungsroman tradition or are they not? How are might they be critiquing it? And by critiquing it, they're participating in the discussion of what a novel is, what literature does, and they're coding social desire over time. Um, uh, interesting things to just some references to notice um, in Potted Me, um, and I'm not going to walk through the whole novel, but, but uh, uh, particularly notice the hip hop references because I talked about hip hop last week, especially with Kendrick Lamar and reading hip hop as literature. And here we see Heavy D showing up now that we've found love. So you might look up that song on YouTube and look up the lyrics and see how that's showing up. Um, uh, also, who else sh shows up? I, I think Bone Thugs and Harmony show up. Um, yeah, the first of the month. Um, but also African American literature often shows up. So here in the character, the main character of Potted Meat, we see uh, a very much an awareness of his of his blackness, um, his African Americanness. So, for example, when his stepfather forces him to um, uh, recolor the skin of the young girl that he has drawn with himself holding hands with the white girl to 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 draw her color her hair black and to color her skin brown um, there's an awareness of race and i think that's called color um, i think in the or colors in that um, particular the title of that passage 
<clears throat> uh, he wears a Malcolm X hat, but his <clears throat> um, his <clears throat> white girlfriend from school doesn't know what who Malcolm X is or what the X stands for. So there's a there's a double consciousness at work going on there. Uh, he wants to wear the African sign for the African girl um, who who has very very dark skin and doesn't speak English, but he asks her you know what things are like in the mother country sister right on the playground um he is reading novels um by um uh, uh african-american writers um, like iceberg slim um the novel pimp is something uh, uh and um so we're located in generally in west west virginia and we're tracking uh, a life from like elementary school ish through the end of high school and um, the joining of uh, joining the military, um, the U.S. military. So uh, those are some things to think about. So how how um, uh, is that double consciousness that the character has um, uh, weighed against um, the other experiences? So some of the experiences of desire that show up for the main character of Potted Meat, such as love, like his sister asks you, what are you going to do if you found love, right? Like, what would you even do? That I don't know. She's like, no, what would you really do? Like, <laughs> and it's this way that, that, that his sister really calls him out on a kind of idealism, right? Um, superpowers, the idea of having superpowers. Notice that passage. A ninja showing up, right? Like a secret, like a ninja that's going to, to, teach you the skills is going to take you away to Japan and come back. But the ninja ends up um, being a man with a needle in his arm. Confirmation at church, right? Socialized desire. Look at what, it, look, I'm going to be a preacher someday. And like, we get this kind of preachy, preachy moment and everybody's applauding and saying, amen. And, you know, he saves the sixth, um, um, the attitude from Matthew, he saves it for the end. So he's kind of working that in just to show to show people, especially that he didn't forget something, but he's saving the best for last. And then he flips immediately from scriptural passage to, um, I believe that's the part with Bone Thugs and Harmony, to, to rap and wanting to be a rapper and memory, the importance of memory in this character. Um, uh, very explicit um, ways that race and um, uh, African American um, contacts contexts are are important to understanding how social desire works um, in this particular novel. I'm not going to talk more about that. I want you to explore it in your discussion posts um, or with me in office hours. And I'm going to get to office hours here in just a minute. So uh, th we'll take that as the lecture for the week. Um, I'm hopefully going to have a online discussion with. Um, Sila Satterstrom and Stephen Dunn in person and talk about some of these issues. I'm going to talk about it broadly with them and not specifically to this class if we're able to get the, the meeting scheduled this week. But then you'll be able to draw on that discussion and hear from their, their mouths about their own work too and not just from a literary critic's mouth like mine. Okay, uh, email with questions. Uh, have a good week. Um, discussion posts are due Friday uh, and uh, um, comments on peers are due by Saturday night, as usual. Have a good week.